go to the last book of the Bible and look at any of the references to time, particularly the first few chapters, and ask yourself how would a person in the first century in one of those seven churches understood those time references in the book of Revelation. There's not a time zone in which he's not being praised. Listen to me, there is not a moment since the resurrection of Jesus where there's not someone somewhere declaring that Jesus saved. Are there simple rules that we could follow when reading the Bible? That is, rules that are easy to remember and can be practically applied. Well, as we continue in our conversation on biblical hermeneutics, that is, interpreting the Bible, the science of interpretation, I'm going to jump back into something that I left off on in some previous episodes on hermeneutics. That is, I've, I ask us to consider the way that judges and lawyers should interpret the law, or particularly interpret the Constitution, and some of those rules, very practical rules, and where do they come from? Uh, you have to look at the previous episode. We kind of talk about that, the English common law, and understanding how it was interpreted, understanding how many of those who uh, developed English common law were influenced by the Bible and, and the particular principles for interpreting the Bible. Now, I want to jump in just to a couple of the rules we find in Scalia's work. Uh, Scalia and Garner put together a book. Uh, they are from the opposite sides of the political spectrum, but yet they're both, if you will, I'd say originalist, and that is in the sense that they, they follow these particular rules uh, that the text should govern. Uh, I, I, I came first into introduction to the idea of interpretation in uh, seminary. I later came into an understanding of it, further understanding in law school. Yes, I went to seminary, then I went to law school. I know it seems backwards. I think about some of the uh, it's funny, I, th I think about some people said, you know, John Calvin studied the law and then theology. Well, I studied theology, then the law. Uh, so I, I guess maybe I didn't reverse order, I don't know. Well, I noticed the patterns, the, the overlap. So I, the question I was raising and wanted to really think through and trying to help you think through is, are there, are there some basic principles? Do we, on the, th on the theological side, make this idea of interpretation so complex that people don't really know what we're talking about, I, I would agree a lot of times we do that. So how can we then try to simplify it? Why, as I mentioned in a previous episode, understanding the, the entirety of the Bible, the overarching story of the Bible, the narrative of Scripture, obviously is something that we want to, we want to know or we cannot properly understand the Scripture. I also mentioned uh, this idea of being able to, to if you will, authenticate or to validate or even maybe invalidate our interpretation by asking the hard question, does this contradict another portion of Scripture? Because if your conclusion about a text contradicts another portion of Scripture, Scripture does not contradict Scripture, you're just wrong. You say, well, that's a strong statement. Well, I'm going to stand by it. So let's talk about two of these rules that I found in Scalia's work, and let's ask if if there's any application, can we simplify these? Are they already simplified in a way that we could ask, is, there, is this helpful in reading the Bible? We've talked about the grammatical, historical approach, understanding the grammar and the historical context, but sometimes you're not afforded the opportunity to, to sit down and kind of work through that material. You may have just picked your Bible up and started reading it. I, I don't recommend you just randomly open the Bible and then read somewhere. I would say, you know, pick a letter or a gospel, and read through it multiple times. Working through a book, someone says, well, if you had to pick two, I had a, a, a friend, new friend, Brother in Christ, take me to uh, lunch last week, gave me a copy of his book. It was great, by the way. I read the book. I, I, don't, I don't know where it's at right now. I think it's back here on one of my shelves. I read the book on the plane uh, when I was going up to see my children. Wife and I took some of the, well, we took five of our children with us, uh, two of the five were our adults, uh, with us on a flight to see uh, two other children who are adults, uh, married. Three of our uh, children, thankfully, are married, praying uh, for the other four that at the appropriate time that they will find godly spouses, and all of them be fruitful multiply. But uh, I read his book. It was very good. It was, I, couldn't, I couldn't put it down. I just pretty much read through it and like uh, got, got to the Airbnb, finished it up. You say, why are you telling all this? Well, it's interesting because we went out to lunch, and we were talking really kind of about uh, hermeneutics, not really hermeneutics, but we were talking about theology, and, and hermeneutics came up in a sense of, of how 
I read the Bible and some of the rules and where, where I would have people start. And we both agreed, it was funny, we both thought, if you were to tell someone in starting to read the Bible, where would you start? We both had the exact same answer. I said John and Romans. Now, I'll be honest with you, it, it, it probably does depend a little bit on who I'm talking to and the circumstances and the situation that we're encountering, but I'm talking about just generally speaking, uh, yes, John and Romans. So now you say, what well, are they more important? Are they better? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just, I understand the, the nature of Scripture, and I think those would be the strongest places to start. Now, some start in Genesis, and they try to work their way through, but they get very confused. So we might read the Bible front to back, but we interpret it back to front. What I mean by that is that uh, however the apostles were interpreting the Old Testament, that's divinely inspired, and therefore that's how we're to understand the Old Testament in light of the apostolic authority that we see written in the New Testament and ending there. Now, there isn't an apostolic authority that continues on after that. So let's talk about two. I want just to jump into two rules that we find Scalia in his book uh, promoting and espousing for judges when they when they're interpreting the law. And the first one is called the rule of permissible meaning. The rule of permissible meanings. Now I've already alluded to this before, but here's the concept. Neither a word nor a sentence may be given a meaning that it cannot bear. Wow. You, you say, I don't know that I could read the Bible that way. I, I'd be too confused. Actually, there's nothing confusing about this. This is actually a very, very simple and straightforward approach. That is, when you're reading the Bible, now thankfully we have it translated into English, and there, I, there's going to be some passages that we're challenging to translate, but those are the exceptions, not the rule. So when you're reading through, and as you're just reading through the text, and whether it's your study Bible or your favorite preacher or your favorite podcaster tells you there's this secret meaning or this special meaning or the text doesn't mean that, or they're emphasizing something that the text doesn't emphasize, then you need to reject that. Let me give you an example. Uh, and This is one that we really, I think, we, it's been so abused, we might not even recognize. Let's go to probably the most famous verse in the Bible. I've heard this verse abused so many times, really kind of with, removed from its context, that in, in some respects people want it to take on an emphasis or meaning maybe that it does not emphasize or state, and that's John 3.16. I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version. Uh, I, th- I, of course... I can't help but immediately think of the King James Version, because that's how I first heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I've lost track of the number of times that people have quoted that verse and then said to me, it's a whosoever will. Now they're quoting the King James. Now the problem with, with doing that is that that's not where the text emphasizes. The emphasis in the text, and just a plain reading of the text, shows that that's not the emphasis. The text can't bear that out. And then what's happened now is we've, we've imported meaning into the text in the same way that a, a let's, let's use the word left or liberal-leaning judge, somebody who's not an originalist, okay, let's say a non-originalist, uh, uh, would would want, maybe, let's not even use that language. Let's say a judge who wants to bring about social change based on presuppositions that he or she holds to and doesn't want to be governed by the text, but, but it seeks to legislate from the bench. That type of judge is going to take a text in the Constitution or in the law and going to emphasize something or some aspect that the text either doesn't or overemphasize or read into the text or maybe even create these uh, these areas of quote-unquote protection that the text doesn't even announce or even allude to. So what we're doing is we take a text, this amazing text, that is, it's about God, and it is, a, it is attempting to articulate the massive scope of God's love and mercy and grace, and to re, if you will, to to move off of that point 
and pretend that the verse is emphasizing something else is to now read meaning into the text. When you read John chapter 3, the chapter, not only does the chapter not bear out that incorrect emphasis, the book doesn't itself. In fact, I would argue that it that it contradicts that wrong interpretation. Now, you might say, well, is this a is this a debate over the extent of the atonement or uh, the effectual work of the Holy Spirit? No, that's not a debate on any of that. The point here is is that the text isn't ambiguous. It's plain what it emphasizes. We pretend, though, that uh, somehow that what it what it's focused on isn't the focus, or somehow it's ambiguous, and therefore we need to provide an understanding. So within this rule, when you're interpreting the law, uh, an ambiguous word or an ambiguous concept has two or more meanings. So when we we come to a text, for example, we go back to John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. Some might argue that because the world word world there uh, has two or more meanings, uh, it's ambiguous. So does it mean that God loves every single person? Does it mean that God loves all of his creation? Does it mean that God loves the universe? Is it a way of measuring the world numerically? So should we interpret that, that for God so loved seven billion people? Well, obviously, since that verse was written, and since the beginning of time, there's been more than seven billion people. So are we to interpret it numerically? Or when he makes a reference to world, is he making a reference to the condition? So if it's a reference to condition, we might refer to it as a fallen world, for God so loved a fallen world that he does what? That he intervenes, that he, if you will, he sends, or if you, let's go back to the text, he gave, and so of course incorporates sending, his only begotten son, of course, to do what? Uh, to, to die for our sins and impute to those who believe in him his perfect righteousness. So now we get into the challenge of, okay, which is it? Well, all you need to do is to just not read the one verse by itself, but to step out and read the whole context. When you step back and you see John chapter 3, you see that there's a good man who comes to Jesus, good in the sense of defined by the world's good, not defined theologically good. The Bible's clear, none are good, no, not one. Uh, That is only God is perfect, but good in the sense of the way we measure people. So you think of a decent person, um, a a rabbi, a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, Nicodemus comes to him at night, Uh, but yet he's confused. He doesn't understand. So why doesn't he understand? He doesn't understand because of the effects of the fall. And you go on to read, and so I think the strongest answer, and especially not only with what you read before, but with what you read after, you you think about what comes right after. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Now again, the same same concept, same word there. Is Is that a numerical? So it could... It's ambiguous, two or more meanings, but the context would bear out. It seems like he's pointing out the condition um, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. And we see that it seems the stronger interpretation is on the condition. He comes to fallen humanity. So it's it's a focus on condition, not number. Why is that important? Because it's if, if we read into the text our predetermined conclusions, we're not hearing from the text. Why even read the text? Just start writing your own. Uh, it, to me, it's disingenuous to do that. Now, there's this other idea that if, if a word or phrase is vague, so that is, we, we know the meaning in a sense, but... The application uh, may be uncertain in the sense that it could, it could, uh, we could apply it to a number of different situations. For example, I'll give you another example here. Uh, we find in Ephesians it says that don't be drunk with wine, uh, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, some might say that 
that's a total prohibition on any drinking at all. I, I don't consume alcohol in any form at any time. So, uh, but not because I think that's the right interpretation of that text. So the text itself is, is vague in the sense of what's that, does that mean uh, that someone could never have a, a glass of wine or drink a beer? Again, I've already stated I don't, I don't consume alcohol in any form at any time, neither does my wife. So, but is that the proper interpretation? I don't think so. I think the proper interpretation here is, is that this could be applied to a number of different uh, factual situations. So the proper interpretation, which certainly follows these situations, follow the text, would be this. Uh, look at what it's trying to explain is don't be governed, don't allow your mind or your life to be governed by intoxicants, because we think of drunkenness as somebody whose life is being governed or influenced by, by a substance. Instead, allow your life to be governed and influenced by the Holy Spirit. In other words, be, be intoxicated or governed by the, the, the person and work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you might say, okay, now what's that look like? Well, then what follows in Ephesians, that's Ephesians 5.18, what follows is what it actually looks like for that to be applied. So that text can only bear out so much. If not, you're reading more into it. You say, what does this all this mean? I, I think it's this, just the straightforward reading of a text in light of everything that's said before and after it. Finally, let me get into this one in the time we have today, the fair reading method. Now, I've already kind of alluded to this, so these two kind of go together. How would a reasonable person, how would a reasonable reader, fully competent in language, have understood the text at the time it was issued? We, that's where we're going back to that grammar and historical context, but... This is, when, when we, we ask ourselves how they've understood it, well, we already find in the text how that's understood, especially if we go back to John 3, we see John writing, helping us understand how things were understood. He gives us Jesus interacting with people. The Gospels do this. The Gospels are very helpful because we see Jesus interacting with people, and they have, sometimes they misunderstand. Even the disciples misunderstand, and then there's correction provided. So that gives us a a, if you will, a template or a way of understanding how a reasonable person at that time understood what was being said. Of course, you have the authors of the Gospels themselves providing for us as they've written how they understood what Jesus was saying. Uh, now, for us, certainly that's a challenge. There's a number of challenges there, but I think that we just start with um, a, just a fair reading of the text. It, it obviously gets a little more into, like, uh, did the person have an aptitude in language? The, this goes a little bit deeper. Is the person sound in judgment? You know, what we want is the reasonable person is somebody who basically understood language and normal use of it, somebody who's sound in judgment, somebody who's, whose mind is, is uh, capable of understanding. Uh, and then, of course, this is how do you suppress personal bias, but, but that's, that's required if we go into and just want to do a fair reading of the text. If we get into older text, it's going to require us to understand a little bit about how language was used in that time. Uh, and then I think really what this is all getting to is do we understand the purpose? Do we have the ability to comprehend the purpose of the text, which is only to be gathered from the text itself? So when we read a gospel, the gospel authors are helping us, particularly John. He tells us his very purpose at the end of his gospel when he tells us why all these things were written, he gives us his purpose statement, which is extremely helpful when trying to understand. But these are written, he says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He tells you his purpose statement there right away. So I think these are, these are basic principles, but they're good principles. The rule of permissible meanings so we get these, these wild-eyed teachers trying to infuse meanings into text, into words. They've got this secret meaning, this, this hidden meaning. If you only knew the original language sort of thing, let's reject all of that. Let's just go with the plain, straightforward meaning of the text. Let's not try to bring our conclusions into the text, but let's do a fair reading of the text. How's a reasonable person uh, who's fully competent in the language have understood the text at the time it was issued? And I just want to do this as a teaser. 
go to the last book of the Bible and look at any of the references to time, particularly the first few chapters, and ask yourself how would a person in the first century in one of those seven churches understood those time references in the book of Revelation. Not how do you understand them or your favorite commentator understand them now, how would they have been understood in the first century in that context, because that's where we find the rule of permissible meanings, the fair reading method coming into play. Well, let's be faithful in reading our Bibles. Look, you don't, we might not understand every detail of every difficult text. I mean, look, there's going to be some difficult texts. Ecclesiastes is a difficult text. Leviticus can be a difficult text. There's a number of challenges. The book of Job, extremely difficult text, but there's God has blessed us with some texts that are that are very straightforward, and I would I would suggest when we think about, for example, John and Romans. Let me even offer this: maybe maybe you should start with reading the book of James, uh, reading Galatians, other books. Let's just default to the rule of permissible meanings. That is, don't go beyond uh, the text itself. Stay focused on the text, and the fair reading method is how would a reasonable person in that context. Uh, and I think a great case study is how would a reasonable person in the first century, when we hear the time is at hand, how would they have understood those references in the, uh, in the New Testament? Well, until the nations are converted, there can be absolutely no excuse, no retreat, and no surrender. Why? Because Jesus Christ is King.